You know, when things start to go sideways, it can seem like a real mess. So how can Christmas help us with those crazy messes that we find ourselves in? I'm glad you're here for this conversation today. Hi, my name is Rob, and it's great to be able to catch up with you for a few moments here today. Let me just start off by mentioning the interactive teaching videos that are available for kids and families are available on Facebook and a simple search for Cabin Kids when you get on Facebook will take you to our page to that resource related to our congregation. Now, most of us in life are messier than we'd probably like to admit. Family can be messy. Money can be messy. Schedules sometimes get messy and everything seems to be amplified around the holidays, especially at Christmas. Now, what if a gift that we could give to each other this Christmas would be to untangle some of those messes or to even see beauty in the midst of the mess? During these weeks of Advent, we're exploring the path of a very messy Christmas. So let's jump in for today. In some settings, I've shared the story of how when we have been in ministry locations and we feel like God is bringing us to a conclusion at those places, we've been called to resign and then finish out our time, not always knowing where we were going to go next at the time that we said we're going to be leaving. Somewhere along the way in that journey, most of the time, we've had an assurance that we understood where we were going to relocate before we finish work. Now, in one of those locations, where we resigned in advance of knowing the story, there were a myriad of details that were a part of that process of relocating and we didn't know before the work was completed where we were going to go next. As a matter of fact, we ended up in this kind of gap season of our lives where there was a period of time where we just didn't know exactly where we were going to move to. We'd finished work, we were still living in the same location, but we weren't sure what the next step just was. We had an active family, a mortgage, and how do we deal with this? Well, we sought some other employment to be able to kind of bridge the gap, and we put up our house for sale, and we had four young children at the time, and so as you can imagine, living life was a bit of a challenge where you're living life with four young children, and trying to have your house ready so that it could be shown to prospective buyers. And there's even one story in that location where the prospective buyers were coming in the front door and my wife and the four kids were sneaking out the back door as they were preparing to allow the house to be shown. Well, eventually the house did sell and we still weren't sure where we were going to be going, but there was a closing date that was on the books for us. So do we store our stuff somewhere? Uh, there's just not a lot of options for a family of six of us plus a dog to be able to go someplace and just kind of camp for a period of time. The employment options in the area were very good and so as far as sustaining life that was good but the options for where we could stay were very limited and there may not be the same options for employment elsewhere. So what were we going to do? I mean, this is not the way that we had pictured entering into ministry that God was going to take care of us. We, we didn't really picture ourselves in this kind of a spot at any point in our lives. Now, life can go sideways sometimes, and it gets messy when it does, doesn't it? And we've all had moments like this where we look back and think, you know, I'm not sure how this is going to work out. And maybe we've even asked questions like, are we all going to be okay? But you know, when we think about people in the Bible, you know, we think, well, it must have been easy for them. After all, they're in the Bible. I mean, they kind of, because we can see the end of the story, we think, well, they must have known it too. And of course, they were living out the story that we have the opportunity to look back on. They really didn't have an inside track on how everything was going to turn out. So as we dive into our story today about Mary and Joseph, we realize that what happens in their lives really wasn't in their life plan to this point. 
And this was not even close to being easy or convenient. Most people in their day, and most people in our day, would see what happened next as a complete catastrophe, a mess. How do you follow through on what comes next? Mary, like most young women in her day, as she thought about her life, she probably had some common expectations based on the age she was living in. She was engaged at this point to Joseph, as many of you know. And the purpose of engagement at this time in history was to prove her loyalty and her purity, that she hadn't been fooling around with other suitors. Well, as they're going through this period of waiting, they recognize that they're seeking to build credible plans for a life together in their community. And many of you know what happens next. Luke tells us about it in chapter 1, verse 26 is where he starts. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent an angel, Gabriel, to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Verse 29 says this, Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of a greeting this might be. Now, Mary's neat and tidy vision for her life exploded at this very moment. You can imagine her head is spinning with all kinds of questions. And we understand from Luke's writing that Everything he wrote down came from personal interviews with people who were present, including Mary. So this statement is significant insight into the mind and heart of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Now maybe you've been in that spot from time to time where your mind is racing and your mouth is trying to figure out how to catch up. I wonder if Mary's mind was racing at this point. Thoughts about all of the questions it would raise in Joseph's minds, or about the chatter that it would create in the community, that was going to be quite a mess. Or about the hit that her character would take, the mess that she would have of her reputation in the neighborhood now. She would likely no longer be a reputable young woman in her world. She would become an outcast with this kind of news. Now, as things continue to get uncertain, and we can think of all kinds of scenarios, maybe, like Mary, questions have buzzed through your mind. And in this moment, anything that Mary had previously defined as success was going to change because of the improbable story of this unexpected pregnancy. You know, in those moments that we have where we lay awake at night wondering how things are working out or how they're going to work out, and we consider what's going to happen and spin through all of the implications, oftentimes creating spooky scenarios as we go. If this, then this. And if this, then this. And there are moments that all of a sudden, whether they're fabricated in our minds or whether they're very real in our experience, there's a mess that we're now dealing with. And it becomes our natural tendency to try and get everything sorted out. And we often stress ourselves out in the process. So in our family story where we were selling our house and we couldn't find residents, as we're packing up the house, it's a couple of weeks ahead of the closing date and we're still asking the question, what are we going to do? Well, it was about that time that some free storage options came available. And so we were happy about the fact that we didn't have to move the whole house in one day and that we could store our things at that location for a period of time for free. But we still don't have this destination that we need in our minds to know where it is that we're going to move. So as we start down this road, we rent a truck and, and take some things over to this storage area and just keep on working in the community and the closing date is creeping up on us where we had to be out of the house. And there's still no plan as to where we're going to go or for how long we're going to need to bridge this time. So 
Fast forward those couple of weeks to just two days ahead of closing. This is now, because it's the weekend, our window of time to be able to get all our stuff cleared out prior to the Tuesday when the house would close. So the new owner was going to take possession on Tuesday and this was our opportunity to get everything out and clean up the house so that it was ready for them to take possession. So that morning, that Saturday, we have the rental truck in the yard and we're wondering, are we gonna store our stuff and just crash with some friends for a period of time? There's not a lot of housing options for the six of us plus a dog in our area. Are we gonna leave all our stuff stored and then drive the 16 hours to our closest family member and be able to stay with them? Well, people are coming in the doors, they're ready to help and they don't know exactly what it is that we need to pack up or how it is that we're going to pack everything up because we've already re reduced down to the bare minimums in the house. And so the decision at this point is, do we shift everything to storage or do we have a place to go? Well, no, so what do we do? And with the rental truck in the front yard and our friends asking, what do you want us to do? This became pretty crazy and we decided just to make a decision and to go for it. This is the kind of troubled that I think we left Mary with in verse 29. In Luke chapter 1 verse 29, you remember she said of herself, Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. As she recounts this to Luke, this is how he writes it down. And Mary is not that much different than any of us. I mean, just put yourself in the shoes of an overwhelmed teenager. This was an awful lot to process as it was all coming at you from an angel, no less. Life was seemingly rolling past her at this point, and clearly she was afraid. So in verse 30 through 33, we see the angel's reply. The angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you're to call him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Well, it's clear from what happens next that Mary's still thinking that this is totally messed up. This has got to be the craziest thing she has ever heard in her life. It makes no sense to her whatsoever. It's so far outside of her understanding, how could this possibly even be good? Because she can't imagine how this could work. And she even says as much in the next verse. She said, how will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. For the Holy One is to be born, he will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she, who was said to be unable to conceive, is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. Did you catch that last line? No word from God will ever fail. It's like the angel is saying, okay, things may feel like they're messed up right now. But don't forget to look up to God who will never fail. You can trust him with this gap in your experience, this gap in your life, as it gets stretched and gets messy beyond your comfort zone. And so in the next few moments, Mary demonstrates that in these uncertain times, it's called for uncommon trust. Trust that goes beyond the common experience that we have every day, that reaches outside of our experience and leans on the nature and character of God. And she says in verse 38, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Well, then the angel left her. So we see as you read on, and I would encourage you to do so, what happens next. Mary jets and she takes off to see Elizabeth and there's this cool prophecy that comes from their family as John the Baptist, who's in Elizabeth's womb, leaps when he realizes Mary is in the space. And that's just mind-blowing. But then as she returns home, the mess 
is all front and center now. She sees Joseph and he realizes, Mary, you're pregnant. And all the swirling emotions of betrayal and does he let her go? And in his mind, he must have asked questions like, I mean, has she been messing around with somebody else? She's been away all this time. Who would she have met? This pregnancy is going to be a problem for the two of them. And there's a lot of community shame that will fall on Mary. But as we know, an angel reassures Joseph in the story. And once again, we see even in Joseph that those uncertain times call for an uncommon kind of trust. A faith that's needed in the gap of our experience and the challenge that we may be staring down. Now, they didn't know how this was going to work out. And this wasn't even close to being easy or convenient. The reputation that they would have now as a couple was going to be suspect. And most in their day, and even in our day, would see this as a complete mess. But we have the advantage now. We can look back and understand that something completely beautiful was happening, but it didn't look very pretty at the time. So going back to that house, we sat there with the rental truck in the front yard and our friends looking at us wondering, what are we going to do? And so we decided, I guess we'll just put everything in storage and figure it out from there. And some of you may be aware that at the last possible moment, as we're disassembling beds and kind of making some final preparations to load things up, one of our friends who came to help that day arrived late, but shared that he'd been talking with someone in his circle of influence and they anonymously offered a house for free. Just pay the utilities for the period of time you live in it, for whatever amount of time you need. So the packing plan all of a sudden changed and we scurried around to kind of check the place out and see what it is that we needed in that space and the minimums that were a part of what we would use so late that night, as our house was cleared out and we were finished cleaning it for the closing day, we landed, our two adults, four young kids, and one dog in the free house. And it was tight. And the whole time, we had stressed about all of the options where it was just looking like a mess. This unknown approach that we needed to have to this interval time between ministry locations, God had been working out a beautiful picture of his provision and encouragement. And as a family, we look back on that season and still have some of the best times and memories ever of when we were in that free house. We still look back on appreciation with those days. We realize that it's amazing how God took care of us. Now, too often when we're in the middle of the mess, it's hard for us to see how God is making beauty out of something that seems so chaotic. And there are messes that we get into that are sometimes of our own making. There are messes that come our way that are somebody else's doing. There are messes we encounter that sometimes feel like as God has allowed this to come into our path, it's stretching us and it's exposing this gap in us that calls for us to trust beyond the common times in our lives. And in that moment, some shake their fist and some pout about how unfair things are. This is not what I pictured for my life. What a chaotic mess. How could you do this, God? And others trust in an uncommon way, for the uncertain time that they find themselves in. Now, at no point did uncommon trust eliminate all of the other kind of problems for Joseph and for Mary. It didn't eliminate the stigma of the situation. It didn't make walking through the mess all that easier. It didn't even eliminate the mess from their lives. But it did help them to walk day by day, in faith. And later on, Mary and Joseph would have a time to recall looking back and seeing that when things were getting messed up, 
The angel had reminded them both to look up that God would provide, that God would redeem this mess, and that God would help them fulfill his purposes and their purpose in the middle of it as well. This was not even close, as we've mentioned, to being easy or convenient. Most of the people in their day and in our day see this as a complete mess. But now we understand, looking back, how it is completely beautiful. Now, that may just be where the Christmas story can help many of us to be reminded that uncertain times call for uncommon trust. Joseph and Mary's mess, and it's important for us to understand just how messy it was, reminds us how these uncertain times call us to uncommon trust. And it's not just for Joseph and Mary and other people in the Bible as well. It's for us today because their lives help us to see what this can look like as we face the messes that we find ourselves in day by day. So if you're looking at a mess in your life right now, and it's exposing this gap in your life, a space between your experience, which is very common, and something that is now completely uncommon, and all the time as you look at this mess, you see the uncertainty of the times, and it calls for an uncommon trust, a trust that God will create beauty in the midst of something that looks completely chaotic. And maybe our revised version of what the angel said to Mary and eventually later on to Joseph can help us as we pray. When things seem messed up, don't forget to look up to God who will never fail. Maybe that's a prayer you can begin to pray this week. When things get messed up, God, help me to look up to you who will never fail and trust you in this huge messy gap that you're bringing something beautiful out of the chaos. It's hard for us to think about the Christmas story without fast forwarding a number of years later to where Jesus is now hanging on a cross crucified. We recognize that the mess of the crucifixion was creating beauty in ways that we couldn't understand if we were standing there watching and looking on. It was mind-blowing, I'm sure, to be observing what was happening. I don't know how I would have responded. I can't imagine what it would have been like to have been around the table with Jesus and the disciples and to have had him step forward and take some bread that had been a part of the Passover meal and say, this is my body, which is broken for you. Now, when you eat it, I want you to remember me in your life. Remember the beauty that is now created from my brokenness. So in this moment, as we take some time to celebrate communion, let's eat together and think about the beauty that God has created in our lives as a result of his sacrifice. Let's eat together. On that same night, Jesus also took a cup and there were several cups in the process of the Passover and one of those we understand to be the cup of salvation. We wonder if that might have been the cup that he said, this is my blood which is given for you. Drink this and when you do, remember me. Remember the beauty that I am creating by washing your life clean. Let's drink together as we celebrate the beauty of Jesus that unfurls in our lives. God, I thank you for Christmas. I thank you for coming to earth and ultimately fulfilling your purpose by 
dying on the cross and being raised to life again. We thank you that you are present and you are continuing to create beauty in our lives. I pray that in the moments when we're tempted to look around at the mess, that you would help us to appreciate that you are with us and that your words never fail and that you are creating beauty out of what may look like ashes at this moment. And so God, we thank you and we praise you and we glorify you, we honor you today for the way that you work in each of us. Thank you for how you've done that in the past and how you're doing that now and how you will continue to do that in the days to come. We're grateful to you. We thank you today. I pray that for those who are looking around at messes that they find themselves in extremely uncertain times that you will give them the faith to be able to look to your nature and character for an uncommon trust. Help them to look up when things get messed up. In your name I pray, amen. Just before we go, let me just remind you of the podcast extras. You'll find those as a link in the description box of either YouTube or Facebook, wherever you're watching this video. And those are a variety of different resources related to at-home worship, as well as some journaling or conversational questions related to the message. And in addition, there are some links to our congregation. That link that's in the description box will take you to our Kingston Standard Church website, and you'll be able to find all those resources there. Before you go, if you don't mind taking just a moment to like, comment, or share this video, that's always an encouragement for us when you do, and we thank those of you who follow through on that as well. And if you haven't taken the moment to subscribe to our YouTube channel, or if you'd like to like or follow our Facebook page, there are a variety of posts that are going to be coming up here through the Christmas holidays, and we'd encourage you to be able to link so that you can have an opportunity to be able to catch up with all of those as they arrive. Thanks so much again for taking a few minutes to be here together today. We're praying for you and we trust you're praying for us too. And we'll see you all again soon.